Hello, here we are, another week of my Tuesday night live. I wanted to this week bring up the topic of conflicting information. I find that is one of the most difficult things to deal with when coming into this way of life, way of eating. And it's such a common topic within my groups and we discuss all of these conflicting ideas that come up because they raise doubt. They cause uh, problems with friends, family coming at us with uh, opposing views. And I wanted to just go over some of the main topics that have conflicting information and just give you my view and my opinion and know that I am really not dogmatic about anything on um, this way of life because I've learned that, I don't want to say I hate using that term, everybody's different, everybody has to find their own way, but in a sense, we are all humans, we are, are all trying to um, come, come about a healthy lifestyle through this ancestral way that we found to be so healing and so healthy for so many of us. So uh, one of the first topics I'm going to bring up, and thank you so much for joining. I'm looking over in the chat and seeing so many familiar um, people. Um, so I'm going to go over first the conflicting information regarding fasting or no fasting. So the fasting camp says it's great for longevity, health benefits, weight loss, um, cancer. Uh, metabolically, we know cancer cells cannot live off of ketones. They thrive on glucose. So fasting is a way of getting into ketosis. And if you've joined into my ketosis challenge, we are going to talk all about that. And it's been great seeing so many who are taking on this challenge and uh, learning things about themselves. So let's get into the fasting thing as far as the conflicting information. So the opposing side of saying no fasting, they say, don't fast if you have hormonal issues, it's too much of a stressor. And then you'll also hear, yes, you should fast no matter what. It's so healthy to um, not be digesting food so frequently. And then there's intermittent fasting versus extended fasting and what's better and which should you do. Um, the no fasting camp also talks about it disrupting hormones and for some people uh, can result in binging once you've restricted yourself for a certain period of time without eating. For some, it could trigger that. So Again, I'm just going to bring up the topic of all these conflicting um, viewpoints and talk about how for something like fasting, it's very individual and what might not work at the start of your journey might be perfect a little ways in and maybe long term. So that's, I, I love using that term N equals one. You're going to start doing different things, start uh, increasing your, um, let's say, intermittent fasting. Let's say you are initially go 14 hours and then 16 and then 18 and then try an OMAD. And then next thing you know, you stretch it to do a 36 hour um, and learn something about your body, how you feel, how you respond. If you're measuring glucose and ketones, it's particularly interesting to see how your body reacts to different things you do. So um, I think the fasting um, topic is really difficult because we really need to dial into your own particular situation. And that's why I like people to take on a sardine fast or challenge uh, and see how they react to it, see what their glucose and ketones do. Uh, a fat fast is another great thing to, again, 
learn something about how you feel doing it um, and what your glucose and ketone numbers um, show for it. Uh, it's really important that you not compare yourself to others. I find that's a very difficult thing, especially to do within my challenge group, because I specifically did not want the uh, blood work results daily that people are sinking in to me to be shown to each other, because we have to remember we come from all different walks of life here, 30, 40, 60, 70 years of eating garbage and getting into a state of ill health and medications and hormone dysregulation and insulin resistance and all that. And you can't expect your body to do exactly what you want when you want, especially comparing it to another person. So that's another tough thing with, um, with the fasting and um, trying to learn something from others and you really have to learn from yourself. So I think the fasting issue is one where I'm not gonna definitively be in any camp because I myself have gone through a very interesting journey of trying a 72 hour. I've even done a five day, I've done an alternate day, I've done a sardine fast. And all along, it's really interesting to learn and day by day, week by week, month by month, understanding more and more about yourself and how you respond to what you put in your mouth, which we know ultimately is um, the important thing. All right. I know we've all heard things like, if you're not losing weight, you're not eating enough. Or if you're not losing weight, you're eating too much. <laughs> how is that for the epitome of opposing conflicting information. Um, it's so hard to be in a position of in a weight stall and hear both sides of that. Okay, let's look at it. The ones that are saying you're eating too little are saying you got to eat enough that your body trusts <laughs> that you're not in a famine and that you have enough food coming in. And then the other side is saying, you know what, ultimately, calories do matter. And they do, but hormones matter too, and sleep and sunlight, and insulin resistance and medications and so many different things. So it's, again, you have to just keep thinking to yourself, slowly, we're going to figure this out. And we can't get impatient and we can't get frustrated. We have to just keep looking at ourself as our own little private experiment and think about each of those different statements. You're not eating enough. All right. So see how much protein you're eating. See how much fat you're eating. Go on a couple. There's some really, really excellent macro calculators out there that will really pinpoint pretty closely when you compare them about where you should be for your activity level and see where you fall. It is going to involve tracking for a little bit. Okay, boo-hoo. Some people hate that. Can't manage what you don't measure. And I think it's really important, especially for those who are at a point where they're not where they ideally want to be, both health-wise and weight-wise. So um, really important just to think about how you have to be very in tuned with yourself and be willing to be consistent and be willing to track. All right. Another conflicting uh, bit of information is organs. Organs are mandatory. Organs are optional. All right. Where do you stand on that? Leave a comment. Tell me what you're thinking because my, again, I always, I told you right from the start, I'm giving you my personal experience and opinion. I am over 14 years into eating carnivore. I do not like liver. I have not eaten liver or spleen, spleen or pancreas or kidney or heart or thymus or brain 
through any of these 14 years, aside from maybe here or there, a little liverwurst, which I happen to have always liked as a kid. And I found a couple clean ones. And every so often I found a goose liver pate in one of my local stores. And I, it's nice and high in fat and I enjoy it. And I have it once in a rare while, but overall I am not buying and cooking and eating liver. I'm not eating liver crisps or chips. I don't like them. I can't imagine that something that is so essential for me is something that I find so repulsive to think that I actually need it for my health. All I can say is after 14 years of not eating organs, at least for my own markers of occasional blood work and how I feel, I feel amazing. I feel like I'm in perfect health. I feel like at the age of 58 and have sailed through um, menopause and I'm going to hike a mountain this summer and I can flip cartwheels on the beach that there's no indication in my mind that I am doing my body harm by not eating organs. That being said, let's just back up a second here. I do feel that organs are extremely nutritious and extremely nutrient dense and really healthy and good for you. So I have just, a, I guess a year or two ago came upon the product that if you've watched and listened to me, you know, I love, but that product pluck, it is a um, seasoning spice packet that has dehydrated, desiccated, ground up into a mixture of amazing, delicious other spices, but it's got liver, kidney, thymus, heart, and pancreas. I think I got them all in there. I love it. I do not taste any off organ flavor at all. I put it on my eggs. I have a container next to my stove with a spoon in it, and I really enjoy it as a um, multi, like a whatever, a, a seasonal kind of seasoning. So I thought, what the heck? I can get some organs that way. I am opposed personally to spending 60, 80 bucks for a bottle of uh, organs, testicles, placenta, liver, brain. I see it all out there sold in these bottles and I'm not popping the capsules. I'm, I'm just not, I, um, but I'm not opposed and I'm not dogmatic about it. If you feel better taking those, then awesome. I'm happy for you to take that. But again, I'm here for giving you my experience and my opinion. Um, so for me, pluck, and they came out with a zesty garlic. They came out with a little bit of a spicier version. Um, and they have their original. I love them all. I will put a link for a discount in the show notes here because I love it that much that I am so happy to be able to extend a discount if you want to try it. Um, I don't have any sort of link to liverwurst because actually, you know what, I am going to try um, U.S. Wellness, I believe, has a very solid, clean liverwurst that I haven't tried yet. But I can find a couple really good ones at local butchers and even in some grocery stores. So, all right, I'll get off the topic of organs now because I'm going to go on to sort of related in the meat and organ area is the conflicting information about grass-fed, grass-finished meat versus regular grocery store and Costco meat. Uh, and also there's the issue of beef versus avoiding pork and chicken because it's got too much PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fatty acids from the corn and soy it's fed. And then it's like, well, can I eat this? Can I eat this? Do I have to buy this? Which, and then people kind of come at me like, all right, what are we doing here? And I'm like, all right, for 14 years, I just shopped the sales at the grocery store in Costco and I feel great. <laughs> so eat the meat you enjoy and can afford 
I feel there's a huge benefit if, uh, and, and I'm looking into this now of, I'm going to go, you know, with a specific regenerative farmer and get beef that I know is raised in a certain way. And yes, I am going in that direction, but I am going to tell you for sure my experience so far, I don't want anybody to like overthink anything about this whole, mm, what I just said, grass fed, grass fed, organic. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's as best as I can tell you that don't fret it right now. And if you have a great source that you're getting your meat, awesome. If you're not and you're confused about it, just keep shopping the sales. And as your journey continues, like mine, I'm going to find, I don't have a chest freezer. I wish I could buy half a cow and, and do it that way, but uh, I'm going to figure it out. But for now, I just want to get the message out. Hey, we're not eating ice cream and donuts and pizza and cookies anymore. So why are we so hung up on this thing about the, the, the grass fed, grass finished, organic. Let's just not be so fixated on small aspects of this that in the grand scheme of things are not nearly as important as it is to stay out of that carb ditch and stay away from all of the triggers and things that come up in our stressful lives that potentially send us off the rails, then we're really not so concerned whether there was grass fed, grass finished stuff over here when we're in the ditch, right? So let's remember that. And I'm going to back up a second to that organ issue. Really think about this. My entire life of going through my horrible carbon sugar and binge eating and <laughs> eating crap. We're, we were not concerned one little tiny iota about where our organs were coming from and were we buying organ pills and how much organ were we eating and do we have to eat organ, right? There was no thought process whatsoever, that whole entire part of our lives. And now all of a sudden when we eliminate all the garbage and we're eating a really great nutrient dense diet of let's say meat, seafood and eggs. Now we're freaking out about whether we have to eat organs and how much organs and which organs. It's really kind of comical. I mean, I don't know. I find it really funny when I, when I think to that aspect of it. So, um, all right. Next thing I'm going to talk about is there is one camp that says, just eat intuitively. You should have a satiety signal that's going to sh have a shutoff switch. And the other camp says, you got to count calories and macros to make this work because no wonder you're not losing. And how do you think you're going to figure this out if you're not tracking? Eat intuitively. Hmm. For me, I don't have good intuition. <laughs> My intuition was to eat the entire cake <laughs> or the entire pint of ice cream. I intuitively wanted to sit on the couch and eat the whole thing. That's not good intuition. So I don't trust my intuition. When I am in front of a slab of baby back ribs, I don't intuitively eat half the rack of ribs. I intuitively want the whole rack of ribs. So that intuitive argument for me, is out the friggin' window. <laughs> it does not compute here. So I am more of the side where I work much better if I figure out about where my macros are and about where my calories should be. And do I track every single day diligently? No. Will you have to long-term? No. Are we going to figure this out and say, you know what? I know I feel really comfortable with this macro and this amount of food. And from my background, it's important for me to rein it in and pay attention to that and not eat intuitively because 
I often say this, if I've got a ball of fresh mozzarella in front of me, there is no, I get, of course, I eat the ends and then I keep going and I attempt to wrap up maybe the half that's left and put it in the fridge. And then 30 minutes later, it is really singing a song to me to come right back at it and finish it because what the hell, you might as well, because if not, you're going to be eating it all tomorrow. So um, again, that's where my, I don't have sober behavior around certain things and I need to rely on tracking a bit and counting a bit. And I am a little bit scientific like that too, as far as I really like to know what I'm eating that made me feel great or that allowed me to gradually drop down to my ideal weight. So again, you can't manage what you don't measure. So that's my opinion. Other people freak out having to measure and manage anything and say they can't do it. And that's going to be their experience and they're going to make their way through it, um, how they end up doing the best. So, all right. The next thing is <laughs> you guys are all going to get all triggered on this. I can't wait to see the notes over there, but, uh, we need carbs and fruit and honey camp. And we really need to stick with meat and eggs carnivore because that's the core of ancestrally, what we have determined is really healthy and that we don't need a single gram of carbs to live extremely healthy, active, energetic, happy lives. I have had so many people in my coaching groups and private coaching who have told me they just listen to that message about, you know, you're going to ruin your hormones, your electrolytes, you got to have um, some fruit and some honey and were derailed for an entire year. Uh, that taste of sweet does not work at all in my camp. I am dogmatic about that one thing. If you have ever suffered from what you would consider for yourselves a sugar carb addiction, then the taste of sweet is no bueno. It's not going to work. Uh, so I highly advise against that conflicting information. I got to say, I am really in the, the, the one camp on that one. So you will have to decide on uh, for yourself. I think people, person who has been promoting that has never had a weight issue or carb addiction issue and exercises for four to five hours a day and is much younger than maybe a lot here. And it's a whole different ball game. So let's think about that too, um, before you're eager to say, yeah, I got to have some pineapple <laughs> and let's put some honey on my burger. Let's think long and hard before we do that. Okay. Um, the next conflicting bit of information that as I was trying to prepare for this to think about what most uh, topics that come up is the high fat versus PSMF. Because many, many people I know really are, let's say a good percentage, want to drop some weight. And it's important to be able to learn things again about our body by tracking. Uh, you can get into ketosis without doing high fat. High fat is a definite um, way, tool in the toolbox to get into ketosis. Um, if you are trying to lose weight and you eat too much fat, you're going to stall and you might gain weight. So you have to really pay attention and be able to figure out that maybe you're going to do two to four days of a type of protein sparing, that PSMF, protein sparing modified fat, where you're eating plenty of protein and you're reining in the fat so that 
If you're in a ketotic state, fat burning state, reigning in the fat will then allow your body to burn your own body fat. And it's really important if you want to learn about your body and how you react to those different modalities of high fat and the protein sparing modified fat and maybe a very amazing comfortable spot right in between those two might be just right and how are we going to know we'll know if you've been tracking and you might say wow i do great at a 60 40 macro and when i pull my fat in on whatever it is two days a week three days a week that I'm actually seeing results. My glucose and ketone finger prick in the morning is looking really good. I've got my ketones between one and 1 1.5 is a great little sweet spot to be in. Oh, I hate using that term sweet spot. I'm going to have to think of another one, <laughs> a real beefy spot to be in. <laughs> um, but it is very cool to start learning those things. And I'm finding the people that are in my current ketosis challenge group are having a lot of fun in the private chat that they're talking about, watching what their numbers are doing and their numbers are coming into me and I'm seeing that and we'll be talking about that at the meeting tomorrow. So this is really exciting that I feel so many people are so grateful to have this opportunity of a challenge because it really puts you up to saying, all right, I'm doing it. I'm going to pay attention to this. I'm going to see what the results are. And I'm going to make decisions going forward based on the information that happens over, you know, this period of a month. So, all right. The next topic of conflicting information is dairy versus no dairy. There's a lot to be said for being able to have the variety of having cheese and fried cheese and to be able to use it as a tool when you're dealing with cravings. Uh, you can even use it as a tool when you're trying to bump up fat. Cream cheese is amazing. Clotted cream. Like there's a lot of helpful and actually goat cheese has a um, pretty good um component in there to help with ketones. And I think that we have to think about ourselves in the dairy issue because dairy can be inflammatory. If you have any sort of autoimmune issue, I would absolutely recommend you cut it out. Dairy has some casomorphines in it and can have a very, very... <laughs> I'll be front and center raising my hand on that one. Addictive component to it that can be uh, not good when you are emotional eating or eating it for entertainment or eating out of stress. All these other emotional issues, uh, dairy can become a not so uh, good thing to have in your refrigerator for that. So uh, I am on my own path to eliminating dairy and I couldn't have transitioned into carnivore without it. I know that for myself at the beginning, it was just way out of my, uh, thought process to be able to just go down to meat and water at that point. So, uh, again, think about where you are at in this and what your goals are. Dairy is also not a friend for weight loss, guys. And so if you're looking for a change and you want to make a change, you got to make a change and you have to consider maybe that's one of the things that has to hit the high road. All right. I might as well then talk about the sweeteners versus no sweeteners. Conflicting information because there's so many out there that use so many of these sweeteners, um, you know, the erythritol, the allulose, the monk fruit, the stevia, and it is really not, hang on, I got to get my, um, it's really not ideal for 
any of us who have had any issue with carb and sugar addiction. And if you've listened to some of my lives in the past, I talk about going from our world of, you know, the garbage, the, the cookies, the ice cream, the chocolate, our world of the addiction to switching into keto, ketovore, carnivore. When you switch into those uh, sweetened or sweeteners in your coffee, in your electrolyte drinks, the lemon lime, the mango, the raspberry, think long and hard about the stevia that you are downing on a daily basis. And is it inhibiting fat loss? Is it actually something that was prohibited in Europe for many years and then was allowed back in? And in my mind, who's paying off who to hide what studies? And there was studies about uh, potentially uh, carcinogenic effects of some of these sweeteners. We don't have long-term effects on it. And what I like to say is if you're just walking along on earth out in the long, long hundreds of years ago, were you coming upon some flavored LMNT sweetened powder to put in your water and drink? Were you coming upon a uh, bit of allulose to pour into your mm, chocolate pudding keto dessert. I, I just try to, without being dogmatic, encourage everybody to think long and hard because there are, there are you, the people who are hooked on it will, will say, well, no, the studies show it doesn't raise your blood sugar and the studies show it doesn't affect your insulin levels. Well, guess what? Our bodies are so smart. And when we put something in our mouth that tastes sweet, our brain kicks in and says, aha, look what's coming down the pike here. Something sweet. We better start prepping and um, getting the insulin going because we got to be able to take care of this. So I, am a big proponent of eliminating all sweeteners. The sweeteners are like I said, changing seats on the Titanic. Where are you going with that? <laughs> Think about it. And we might as well, uh, oh, and monk fruit, um, there's legislation to ban it in the UK. It has, I got to look, read my notes, tri triterpene glycosides and flavonoids in that. Stevia, was found to cause digestive problems, hormone disruption, and allergic reactions in some people. In 91, it was banned in the US due to early studies that suggested it was carcinogenic. In Europe, it was banned due to animal tests showing risk of some cancers as well as infertility in, in men. And But now it's approved. How does it get approved? How much money gets poured in to getting a study to show it's safe by a company that is out to make millions of dollars on the sale of this awesome, sweet drink or food that doesn't have calories in it. It's 300 times sweeter than sugar. Um, bottom line is sweeteners did not exist hundreds of years ago. And it's not something that we need in our body or that belongs in our body. And I just strongly encourage anybody who's holding on to it for dear life be, uh, to get rid of it. And one of those things is that the one thing that we most hold on to is most likely the one thing we most need to give up to progress. So, and remember I was talking about that um, cephalin phase insulin response, CPIR, which is when your brain senses sweetness that there is an insulin response. I just don't think that there's, I know some people say, well, I can't do this without having my keto dessert or you can, you can. 
man for millions of years was not out there looking around for dessert and um, think even, and I say, even just do it for 90 days. I say do it for six months and then say after the six months, I can go back to it. Uh, give yourself a time period where you just do the hard thing and see what effect it has. Because if you want to make a change, you have to make a change. And with that being said, I know this is not going to be the popular part of this video is coffee and caffeine, the information that it's actually healthy versus coffee is a drug. It's an insecticide, a pesticide. It's an addictive drug. It can mess up your microbiome, increase your triglycerides, mess with your adrenals and cortisol and disrupt your sleep. So you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> As opposed to the opposing camp that says, the opposing camp who's addicted to it will say, you know what, it's good if you have two or three cups a day, it's good for your blood pressure and it can do this and it can do that. Who funds those studies? The coffee bean industry? I don't know. All I know is naturally, oh, I see your people, and people are giving me the sad face with the coffee. I know, guys. Um, it, but you know what, do it. Do it for six months. And I just had a, a private one-on-one -on -one coaching call today and this exact topic came up and this woman was so ready and so adamant about this aspect of her health that she really desperately wants to have improve. And she's already carnivore since December. And we were, I was going into what her daily habits are and, what, you know, everything about it. And well, what has she got? She got the morning. Oh, it's decaf. She says, there's still caffeine and decaf. There's still 700 chemicals in there that are bathing your microbiome. And I said, come on, you got to be willing to make a change to make that change to see if you're going to have this change. And what we need is a little substitute because you know what? I was addicted to coffee too. I mean, I went through college, grad school, of course. Who doesn't drink coffee to get you through studying and pulling all nighters and all that, right? So I got to the point though, once I was off of being addicted to sugar, carbs, and processed foods, I was like, I didn't want to be addicted to anything. So I switched to decaf. I still like my ritual. Oh. The aroma of it, this is just water, the aroma of the coffee, the warmth, the ritual of it, the taste of it, because of course I put heavy cream in it. I don't like black coffee. So was I really wanting the cream or was it the cup? I don't, it was everything. So I just talk about you. Yeah. Tea's even worse. And I hate to break that to people too, but that's a, a leaf and a plant and we don't want that either. All right. So what I was getting at was I explained to her, we're going to just need a substitute because you're not going to be happy initially, at least to just drop your addiction. Uh, and luckily once you're on decaf, it's not that big of a deal to drop as far as not dealing so much with the caffeine withdrawal, but the withdrawal from the ritual is a big deal. So we talk about my hot nog drink, putting a couple tablespoons of butter, some boiling water, like halfway up, because then I get my frother and froth that up. And then I dump in while I'm frothing two raw egg yolks. And then I fill a little more water and, okay, don't have... Yeah, you can put capella drops in, a little almond or coconut, a little cinnamon. Zhuzh it up a little to get yourself off of the damn coffee, all right? Do what you need to do. No sweetener, though. Um, but even, you know, all right, like I said, do which a little vanilla extract, a little cinnamon, and you froth up that butter and egg yolk, it's really good. And that's a great little substitute ritual. <laughs> The other thing is I don't have uh, make um, bone broth, 
either get like Kettle on Fire is a good brand, or a lot of the stores have a nice refrigerated section one in their butcher department. And froth in a tablespoon or two of butter in really hot bone broth. It's amazing. It's really good. And you just sip that as your morning hot drink. Uh, the other thing I love, which I already did one of these today too, was, um, I know it sounds weird, hot water. And don't shoot the messenger here, but I do put a little wedge of lemon that I just float in there. And I drink a nice thermos of this of hot water that incredibly is very enjoyable. Um, so again, these are substitutes for the ritual to help get over that. And I just think it's really helpful. And in your mind, just keep thinking coffee is not a health food. Um, it increases triglycerides. It's a sleep disruptor. It disrupts your hormones. Like I was saying, and think about your path to health. I know though, everyone's like, don't take my coffee. Don't take it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to pull the rug right out from under you and just say, suck it up, buttercup. Just try it. Unless you're perfectly at your ideal weight with no medications and feeling amazing and you want to have your coffee and accept the potential implications of what it might be doing long term to your microbiome and maybe your skin. Um, maybe we don't want to be able to get early wrinkles and maybe the coffee is doing something. I don't know. You know, there's so many different question marks when you're putting something like that into your body day after day after day. Cause you think about how, what a repetitive habit this is. So, uh, all right, I'll get off of that. Cause I was, I'm actually thinking about making an entire video going into detail about coffee and, that way it would be easy just to be able to forward one really cool video that has very <laughs> definitively lined out, lined out the different aspects of it that might encourage people to give it up. All right. The other conflicting bit of information just to end this up because now it's not as important, but I like to throw it in here because I do get a lot of people who ask me questions about my workout method and um, it's the high intensity hit CrossFit camp versus what I do is slow burn, low reps, heavier weights to reaching momentary failure. And that, that method is so much lower risk of injury. You can do it in very safely the rest of your life, which we really do need to lift weights the rest of our lives because we are just going through sarcopenia, which is basically the um, wasting away of muscle unless we are actively combating that muscle wasting situation by triggering our muscle fibers to say, hey, uh, buck up guys, she needs it here. Look what's happening. And I do lower body first, upper body all in one session, just twice a week, which to me, hello, this is like a win-win here. It's minimal time. You don't have to be a gym rat. It's really effective. It's only twice a week and you can literally do it in like 30 to 40 minutes. And I, so I strongly encourage everybody to, if you're not doing any sort of weight bearing training, you need to buck up and figure out how you're going to, how you're going to do it. The next thing is cardio aerobic exercise versus zone two cardio training. And, you know, if you've watched me, I am training to climb Mount Whitney this summer. So I am trying to be really steady on getting my time in, in zone two, which is the number 180, subtract your age from it 
and you've pretty much got about, so for me, 180 minus 58 puts me at 122. So I try to keep my heart rate between 112 and 122 to be in, that's a really good way to estimate, estimate what zone two is. And it's a really effective way for cardio training to increase your cardiac health in a very simple, easy way, because you're actually exercising not to the point where you're out of breath, you can hold a conversation, you can do it for long periods of time, and you get a lot of benefit from it. So I really encourage I'll put a link to um, a couple videos about the zone two mafetone method training, just in case you're interested in looking further into that. So all right, I think I hit on most, I don't know if you want to type over in the chat if I missed another biggie on conflicting information that maybe I missed. Um, oh yeah, so you're commenting over on uh, hot water with apple cider vinegar. A lot of people really enjoy as another um, hot drink substitute. Uh, Wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna cruise through some of these messages here because I'm I'm re this is great uh, no organs for me uh, chicken liver and gizzards I like nothing else well so I mean there is benefit to chicken lizard and gizzards. I've actually tried chicken heart at some of those uh Brazilian meat um restaurants where they come around and put on your plate all sorts of different meats and uh some of them have chicken hearts and I find them really kind of enjoyable. Uh <laughs> when go organs unless absolutely necessary. Yeah, and that's why like I said that pluck is just so cool. Oh, look. So Mary C says she loves pluck seasoning too. So, uh, Glenn said, what spices are in it? Um, it's all the way around my Island and over there, I could pull it out as far as like the extra spices. Uh, I can't remember. I think it might be uh, a little paprika, maybe a little, there's Redmond seat, Redmond salt, Mm, I can't remember. Um, it's, it's delicious. Uh, KG said, love meeting you at KetoCon. I'm doing your first 72 hour fast with me on the ketosis challenge. Awesome. Done several 48 and love alternate day fasting. Perfect timing. You're on vacay last and you need a reset. Yeah. So I find some of, some people are making comments who had never been able to really even get to a 24 hour fast. I, I tell you, once you get really, for me, it's right about the, right between the 36 and 48 hour point is still a little bit of a struggle. And then once I go to sleep and wake up the next morning, I'm not hungry. So <laughs> Mojo Redbeak, that's really funny. You prefer pianos over organs. <laughs> I do too. I like, I can play the piano a little bit. I would love to get a keyboard and have that here. All right. I am going to jump off because I don't want to have this get too long and uh, end up um, having it that I get so far off topic because, you know, when I make the, uh, the thumbnail on the topic, I, I'm trying to stay on topic because I go off the tangent to a fault, I think. So, I'm trying to be really good about that. So, all right. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I really appreciate if you, I know there's something here about subscribing and hitting the like button. Um, and that would help me out. I think, I don't know how this works, but uh, I'm going to keep trying as best I can to uh, cover topics that you all are interested in. So if you could in the comments, write because I do really go in there. I don't know if you guys notice, I try to really um, uh, answer back uh, a lot. And uh, if you tell me what topics you're interested in and we will put them into a video going forward. So have a great night, great sleep and 
see what you're going to do about that coffee and the sweeteners. <laughs> Bye, guys.